Um, hi, I'm John Paul Smith. I will talk today about uh, a complete Christmas gift because this is a, a real network management system that we released recently and that can actually be used to deploy commercial grade telecom networks with LTE or new radio physical layer. So if you like the presentation, just take a picture of the QR code. It will open the presentation on your smartphone. So that works with WeChat, that works with anything that can read a QR. Then you'll find all the references, all the downloads of all the source code, and in every part of the presentation, when you go down, there is the text. So, have you tried to open it? Works? Okay. Then, if somebody wants to get ready, we have a SIM card for trying for real the network management system, which we actually bought. So you need a, a SIM card opener. I'll give you the, the SIM card. And we have an opener. You can try it on your phone. And uh, Raphael from Nexity will help you to configure your APN. So, five steps. What's Nexity? What is our Christmas gift? What's the history of SAPO SNMS? How it was designed? And what's the future? Nexity is the largest European free software publisher with 15 million lines of code, about 15 software. We've been there for nearly 18 years. We are present in Europe and Asia. We have all kinds of very big customers from central banks, automotive makers, uh, governments in US where we do IoT and road usage charging. And uh, our software stack has infrastructure back-end and front-end. We have an equivalent of Google Drive that works perfectly offline inside a web browser. We run a big ERP in pretty large companies, and our infrastructure has the only open source cloud that actually works. Um, it's Christmas. And it's Christmas thanks to systematic competitive cluster, which helped us get through a project for something called Grand Défi du Numérique. It's a French government-sponsored program, which goal was to create a fully open source, possibly open hardware, telecom vendor infrastructure. So we hope it will happen someday, but it's actually moving forward. Open source, free software, I should say, rather than open source, open hardware, and that really works to deploy a real commercial 4G and 5G network. If you want to get an idea whether it really works or not, take the TGV between Paris and Lyon and just experience 4G on the TGV and you'll get an idea that it really works. Mm, so this is how the LTE-NR network management system we did looks like. What is important is not the map. What is important is the list of open tickets. The goal of the network management system is to automate the whole process of detecting something going wrong in the infrastructure, opening a ticket, forwarding the ticket to the right person, solving the problem that was possibly found, and then improving the automation so that such problems don't happen again. So this is what matters. Here what we see is when we see computer, that's the sanity or the state of the base station hardware. And on the right, it represents the services such as eNodeB, EPC, but also Edge services running next to the base station. This was first introduced at MWC 2018. And one of the first things you can do is provision an eNodeB remotely by specifying the parameters of the eNodeB, the frequency, in a way that is independent of the eNodeB version. Sadly, some eNodeB or SDR vendors, they like to change the configuration files at every release. So we need a way to specify how we want the radio to be configured on the infrastructure in a way that doesn't depend actually on the version or even on the vendor. That's the first step. Then, sometimes we see that some base stations have been terminated. People just disconnected them, then it's red. Others are green, which means they are running. 
And if something gets red, we want to dig and find out why. So for example, here we have an E node B that's red and an EPC that's live, but that's not red. Actually, what we see here is the E node B and EPC I brought today. So when we dig into the E node B service that's running on the generic PC that implements the LTE uh, uh, radio, we can see something called promises. Promise is a concept of system administration that was created by Mark Bergress about 20 years ago at Oslo University. What it says is that if we want to operate a system or a network, we should first define how it should be. Not what we should do, but how it should be. And once we define how it should be, we make the system autonomously converge towards the state it should be. This is actually why SAP OS works. It's a promise-based system. It's not an imperative system. Fully. Fully. For 10 years. And so uh, we define, for example, that there should be enough storage so that the node B runs properly and can write logs. But it didn't compute the storage, so it tells me an error. Attention, I still don't know what is the available storage. The promise is not completed. Then we can dig further, look at this kind of graph. That's what usually people show to you when they talk about network management system, but it is a wrong image. A true network management system is about managing the network, not debugging the network. And managing the network means managing the process of detecting faults and resolving them through a ticket management approach. So we show this to make people feel good, that it looks like a network management system, but the truth is that the first picture with the tickets at the bottom and red or green base station is the true network management system. So, features. First, it really works. We are not doing research. We have made a system that's being mature for 10 years. It's used for the Terralab Big Data Center of French government, for GrandNet, which is a global CDN that also exists in China. We use SlapOS to deploy at the edge in automotive factories of uh, very big European makers, uh, we use SAPOS to deploy, deploy edge systems, and it's used by Rapid Space. It's entirely free software, completely documented. Actually, Amarisoft paid the documentation through a new association called the Endowment Fund for Free Software that can actually pay open source through tax discounts from big companies. It's supported commercially. You can click there, you will see the price. So let's have a look. You will be shocked. Open link in a new tab. So this is the pricing. We will manage a master system for 800 euro per month. That's the price to manage a commercial cloud or commercial network. Then plus 40 euro per month per base station or per node. And that's all. This is how much we charge our existing customers. It's enough for us to deliver the service of a reliable system. So you so even this is transparent. It supports SDR for now. Sadly, only a Marisoft, which is proprietary. We'd love to support more, for example, SRS or Open Air Interface. The criteria for us is reliability. We care much more something perfectly reliable than something that has the latest feature. If we need the latest feature, we just pay a Marisoft. We get it, it works. If we could get something reliable, with not with the latest feature, we'll be glad to integrate it. And we hope also to integrate with dedicated hardware, such as Bicell, because Bicell produces this day not that bad things, but really, really cheap. No, Bicell is uh, made by ex-Huawei employees, and they make, for example, a box this size for less than $1,000 that does E-Node B, an RRH, 20 watt, you plug it, it works. Uh, a low cost uh, Huawei, if I know. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it is, uh, you, you exactly <laughs> said it, <laughs> it's a low cost Huawei. That's, and, and they sell super well worldwide. 
Um, so the NMS scope, C node B provisioning, EPC provisioning, SIM card database provisioning, base station management. We can handle centralized or decentralized VRAN. Centralized means one big server connected by optical fiber to hundreds of RRH. Decentralized means one in OD, one RRH in the same box. Um, we have a built-in IPv6 backhaul with latency optimization to Babel protocol. This way, we can actually combine multiple sources of access to the backhaul, whether it's wired or wireless, and in real time, it will take the best one. Uh, we can provide HTTP acceleration at the edge because we already have a CDN, edge buffering for IoT networks, for example, to convert MQTT into something that's properly buffered. Or we can do edge offloading for storage or AI. All this is already in production in real systems. It's not research. Accounting and billing, predictive maintenance. Um, we have success cases in CDN, in China, in virtualized networks, in buffered data collection, we run a cloud operator with the same technology. We are 10 times cheaper than Amazon. Based on Open Compute Platform, you can get a 256 gig server with 10 gigabit LAN and 4 terabyte SSD for less than 200 euro per month. So this really, really works. The only thing we could still not do is run a commercial operator. Because with the MMS, we could run a true commercial LTE and NR operator. I would say today between 10 then thousands of sites. We could go to tens of thousands, but that would require a bit more effort. But we are sure with the figures we have that it's not an issue to do tens to thousands. It could be for public, also LTE as a service. Somebody buys a box, puts it in the parking, and the box gets automatically connected to the network of Orange, SSR, or any existing operator as a kind of network extension or private LT networks in factories, because more and more factories for industrial automation are considering LT, we have it. We can unify edge and central office. That's a great feature of SAP OS, because it can encapsulate in one single description the SDR configuration, the edge service configuration, and the backend. And when you request one thing, you get all of them instantiated at once at the same time. And in a sense, what we do is the true convergence between IT and networking, because we've turned networking into an IT service through SDR, and we have an already mature IT system that encapsulates and automates orchestration of arbitrary services. So we really want someone to come to us and tell us, let's do a true commercial LT operator together. We have RRH. That was one of the big problems. Of course, we get them from AWS, Airlinks, or BayJT. They are not bad, but they are either expensive or hard to purchase because the companies are small, their products are great, but sometimes, for example, they can't get the transistors from NXP because all transistors have been purchased by Chinese or by others. But the good news is we got now the full open protocol for a first very famous, but we must say secret, RRH vendor. And just a few months ago, we got again a very famous a secret RRH vendor who opened their whole protocol and payloads for CPRI, which means it's just a question of days or weeks before we can provide super powerful RRH, the same as those that telecom companies are currently using, probably you are currently using. Pure CPRI. True CPRI. So you, okay, so you, you have the, the, the We have the whole documentation. We have all documentation. We can provide the whole system with, and we know the payload. We know from bottom to top everything. In ten, and it's ten gigabit CPRI, not three, but really the highest end. We don't tell the name. We will not tell you anything. So this is the problem, because all the vendors keep being secret. So we would love more people to join us and provide their payloads for their CPRI. And I think that one of the issues we see is that currently the big four, they don't even want to sell us our RH. They don't want to tell us the standards. The big four is a Nokia, Ericsson, Huawei, ZTE. 
So I don't know if we say big four, big three now with the T. But they don't want to sell. They don't want to open their protocols. And that breaks completely the possibility. So this is over because now we have famous but secret RRH vendors ready to work with us. But the issue is that they are ready to work with us with a certain stack, not with another stack. With a certain CPRI card, not with another CPRI card. So there's a terrible practice, kind of anti-competitive behavior in telecom industry where the RRH vendor forces to use a certain E-Node B. The PCI CPRI vendor forces to use only one RRH or only one stack. It's a game where every party tries to link one element with the next one. So. I believe, although we can provide today our RH and the whole chain, things will only become competitive once we have open hardware for everything. The CPRI card, the RRH, the whole chain. And I believe this will happen soon. So, the history. About 10 years ago, NextAD created Edge Computing. I double-checked with the people at the European Edge Computing computing consortium in front of a focus and apparently there's no single commercial edge computing system that was available before ours around 2008-2010. So I've been, we thought maybe we were one of the first, that's probably the truth, but for now I still have not found who was the other one. We did that because we were trying to do cloud without data centers by putting microservers in homes and making a kind of distributed network of collaborating uh, services hosted in different places. So, Flatwest NMS is just an application of this old system. We often get two questions after we talk about Flatwest. Why don't you use OpenStack? Because it doesn't work it cannot work, it will never work. And there are one technical reason why it cannot work by design. And it's very sad, but it's not a promise-based system. It's an event-driven imperative system. So you get this kind of figure. For example, in 2016, we rented servers from OVH, so you start online, then also from OVH OpenStack and Rackspace OpenStack. And we had our own machines, like on the left, they are stupid machines connected to a plain network and electricity. And we counted over a period of one year, how many of our, we have about 300 machines, how many of our 300 machines would reboot without notice. We, we run critical applications like billing systems, like factory systems. So an in, and a reboot that happens without being notified is the worst thing. It can lead to database corruption. So it's a very important criteria. What we found is that with a small server in our German office, where we had a few, they never rebooted. Those in Japan, once a year, because in Japan it's compulsory to stop electricity once a year to verify the network. The best of the best was OVH. OVH dedicated servers, the bare metal ones about 0.11, like less than 10%, about 10% servers would reboot unexpectedly. And if we go to online.fr, it would be 0.15. So 15% servers would have one reboot, or one server would have 0.15. Then when we go to OpenStack, between one and two unexpected reboots with Rackspace and OVA, between three and five. So, unexpected reboots with OVH are higher than unexpected reboots of a bare metal system on a standard home electricity. Why is that? We heard the same things for, from others, because at some times in point, the whole system becomes in an undefined state, and the only way to reconvert to the state where it should be is to reboot everything. It is because it's not a promise-based system, unlike Flatland. I beg people to stop using OpenStack. Please. Please, stop. Each time I meet a customer and I say, we have an open source cloud, they say, stop, we already tried open source cloud with OpenStack, now we go to Amazon. 
these, the big companies who are our customers, now they don't trust us because we use Python, like OpenStack. Then they tell us, oh, Python, no. We'll get the same problems as with OpenStack. Then we say we do open source cloud. They say, no, no, no. We already tried OpenStack. It doesn't work. It becomes a liability for the free software community. It's terrible. So please stop marketing this. It hurts companies like us. Because OpenStack doesn't work, we can't sell ERP anymore. It's because OpenStack doesn't work, when we say the word Python, people go away. Second thing, why don't you use LXC and Docker? OK, now I'll tell you. We've been using containers for 18 years in XD. CHroot, Linux vServer, OpenVZ, and so on. So it's not as bad, but LXC and Docker images are not portable. If you take one image, you move it to another system, there is no guarantee it works. So if you deploy LXC images on a production server, you might get at a point when the binary issues a system call that the host kernel doesn't support, and it crashes. It's just, like, just as bad as the Orion Rocket 5 bug, where you have floats, big floats and small floats that don't match each other, then the rocket crashes. Here you have one image that depends implicitly on one kernel with a certain system call, another kernel, the type of the two kernels don't match, then the binary crashes. What about the Docker files? Sorry? What about Docker files? Docker files? I can't say. But uh, I, I'd be glad to talk more. But what I say is, if the host distribution and the guest distribution are not the same, then the chances that you hit a missing system call are high. Second problem, not all system calls are containerized. If at some point in time, I think it's no longer the case, but you should double check, free minus ash, minus h, the system call was not containerized, so the values were nonsense. So, it's risky. There are ways maybe to make it work, but that's how the people use containers is not in a way that guarantees it can work. So I would really go away and especially think you have to attach SDR code to C nodes and close of the processor. How can you be sure that this will work with recursive uh, system D? It's very hard. So I will go fast on the design. Um, everything is a service, so an E node B is just a service like an HTTP server or an ERP. If we understand that everything is a service, we can make a very simple system that unifies storage, compute, network, everything. So when we type SlapOS request MariaDB, we get a database. If we type SlapOS request AmariSoft ETC, we get an AmariSoft ETC. And by just having a model of request delivery account invoice, it doesn't matter if we are doing this for a web server or for an LT network. One of our goals was to be, uh, let's say, completely universal and depend on nothing. So I let you read the presentation. We believe that whether a service is deployed in the antenna, in the data center, in a fine draw, in a satellite, it should be done in the same way. There's no reason to do it differently. So we've been, for example, deploying services in 777 flying airplanes that were connected to a data center. And let's go fast. Yes, that's one reason why we work. SlapOS has only two components. Most orchestration cloud systems have dozens of components, 30, 40. In our case, only two. What we said is that any cloud or network will end up producing an invoice. When you look at an invoice, if it's detailed enough, it has all the information to provision the service. Because the customer wants transparency, wants to know why he was invoiced, and the only way to explain to a customer why he, he was invoiced is to explain what he ordered in detail and how it translates into money. 
So if we use on one side an ERP and on the other side a DevOps system, we have a cloud system, a network management system, we have it all. We don't need more components. Because we found out that this simplification was possible, we could achieve real commercial cloud service that very big companies fail to achieve. So that's the trick. Simplifying the architecture by finding out that different components are actually the same. The provisioner, the billing, the hardware management platform, they are actually the same. Uh, well, we have recursivity, federation, zero knowledge. We are able to deploy things without storing any password in a central server. And this is what I want to go a bit further. We call the way we deploy service nano containers. That's just for marketing. They are just plain Linux processes running under non-supervised user. But we use a declarative language to try to define what is supposed to run. We don't say what to do to start or stop a service. We first declare what is supposed to run. This makes system administrator very angry because they are not used to that. They like to... <laughs> so, de declaring a service will make it possible to converge back to what it is supposed to be, no matter the exception that happens. We were bare metal since the beginning, compatible with hard real time. We want to be able to support multiple versions of the same service on the same bare metal server with multiple instances of any version. We don't use super user because we believe it's a security issue. We are portable from one distribution to another because we just recompile the declared service from the GLFC up to the service. So we have no issue of portability. We are even portable from Linux to another Unix because the same service can be declared in a same way in Len on the Linux or another BSD. I think that's useful. If you don't want to be hit by Linux security bug, ability to run on very different OS gives you more resiliency. So not, it's not necessarily stupid to use Linux and another OS. And then we have source cache, which means we know how to we do something to be sure we can rebuild after 10 years any service we built today. So we cache the source code of the upstream automatically. Uh, if you study open source projects, you will find out that many of them are removing source code that they release one day and maybe one year after you cannot find it anymore. And we support uh, virtualization, namespaces. We even support containers, but we don't recommend them. So we, that's another trick in our architecture. We don't use OSPF, but Babel protocol. And this way we can ensure that the network and the backhaul are always low latency and circumvent any uh, error in the routing pro of the infrastructure. We stop using BIOS. We use Linux boot to be sure we don't depend on any proprietary firmware on servers or machines. And for the future, we will focus on time-sensitive hybrid networks because one of the very few markets that seems to be open will be the market of factories and industrial automation where I think a significant part of frequencies has been reserved by government in Germany so that companies can themselves deploy 5G networks without depending on a telecom company. So there's a market there. But this market will exist if the network provides something that's hard to get today, and that's called TSN, time-sensitive network. TSN now is adopted by industrial automation industry, together with something else called PubSub, and a standard called OPC UA. What changed one month ago is that OPC UA evolved from, I would say, a primitive, even driven imperative standard, the kind of things that are not stable, to a promise 
standard with the PubSub extension. So if you know the other standard called DDS, data distribution, now OPC UA is closer to DDS than before, which makes it reasonable for industrial automation. And combined with 5G and low latency in 5G and the opening of frequencies to the industry, there is something to do. And this is what we'd like to do, and possibly through a research project or commercial collaboration. You can find references, documentation, everything's online. Um, to give you an idea, a good engineer from Telecom Paris, just graduated, can, in two days can set up a whole system, ENOD, nodes, billing, network management, everything from bottom to top. We have a 300 pages tutorial, 300 screenshots, and a good engineer can do it alone. We've tried it already on five people. So it's open source and really documented. Okay, thank you. <laughs> ah, yes, who tried? Did you try the network? So you could use uh, your phone on the little network. So this is actually open hardware now. So if it was amplified with a bit, combining this open hardware with an analog amplifier should be sufficient to provide a one watt network. Yes. So Lime became open hardware. And we and BGT 